And now people, hard-working people, their 401ks are down 60%, the saving, their life savings. And then the, uh, this Patriot Act, which is a, an abomination. The Patriot Act has attempted to destroy the First Amendment of free, of free speech, especially with national security letters. The Fourth Amendment for warrants necessary anytime you're going to search somebody's uh, home, especially. Uh, now sneak and peek warrants where they can go break into your location, they can copy your hard drive, they can take and, and uh, photograph your papers and then just leave the premises and never tell you that they were there for an extended period of time. The Sixth Amendment, to be able to just throw people in jail indefinitely without bringing them before a trial, before a, a, a court, to be able to torture people. You know, the other day when I saw Cheney on Fox News talk about torturing people, and I'm a very big fan of 1984, the book, and if we were having a course here, I would make everybody mandatory read 1984. But anyway, Big Brother, that was in, uh, in everybody's home on this big telescreen, and of course a camera to watch you as well. You know, Big Brother was on there all the time with propaganda, and I, I looked at George Cheney uh, uh, talking about torturing people, and you know, I got this feeling that I, deja vu, that this is what exactly Big Brother looked like when he was talking out of that telescreen. It gave me the exact, a guy that's going to sit there and tell you that I can torture people. And it's okay. Well, the founding fathers, <laughs> you know, the founding fathers would have nothing to do with this. I'm sure of it. They were extremely against quartering troops and doing other kinds of uh, uh, negativity on, on a, uh, on a uh, military basis like that. I think personally that before you would think about waterboarding anybody, I personally would like to see anybody that orders that to go through 80 waterboardings themselves. If you can pass through 80 waterboardings and still waterboard somebody else, then uh, you know maybe that's the qualifier that you need for people to say torture is okay. I don't know. Anyway, um, I also want to talk about a status of rights because you know we've got this terrible Patriot Act. They snuck it in. It's a horrible thing all the way around. But let me just talk about some of the stuff that you may not have seen. Now, we all know the Federal Reserve was given this private banking cartel back in 1913. There is another document that was passed by Congress in about that same time, and I thought I had it on my computer with me here, but I don't. During that period, same period of time, Congress passed a declaration, now get ready, that all property in the in America belongs to the states, that all property belongs to the states. Now, as a consequence, if you are a homeowner, let's say that you don't have uh, a bank loan, that you have a free and clear property, well, the actual legal status is, is that you're an equitable lien holder. You have a lien against that property. You don't own the property because the state owns the property. Further, the state and your local counties have taken that property and they put that property up for the surety for all the bond issues and the loans for the schools, the, um, uh, the uh, infrastructure of sewers and water systems. Just like the United States is up to its neck in debt, all the counties for all these bond issues that everybody said, oh yeah, let's, you know, they, I mean, they put it before the voters and the voters said, yeah, but you know, you've got billions and billions and billions in loans for these things and your property is the surety for those loans. So give this a thought for a minute. Let's say that China, who's holding $4 trillion of our borrowings, Let's say things get worse and we start borrowing more and we start borrowing more. One of these days, a Chinese banker could show up at, the, at the front, your front door and say, guess what? Your county is defaulted on this loan on this property. And now I am going to put the higher lien than your value to recover this surety that you, that you allowed and you no longer live here. So think about that for a second because, you know, it isn't going to always take bombs, missiles, 
in, uh, invading troops running up the shores of, of, uh, of California to take over California. You can become a debtor to the extent that you could lose the property that you think you own, but once again, you're an equitable lien holder, and also you know, the IRS does the same thing. When they decide that all of a sudden you owe $500,000 against your property, they can come in and put a higher loan and bump you out, a higher lien, and bump you out of first position. So, once again, you don't pay your property taxes, what happens? The property is removed from your possession. You're no longer the lien holder on it. So we don't own property anymore in America. And the founding fathers, one of the things they came here for was to make sure that you could own property. But unless you have an alloidal title or a land patent, you are nothing more than a lien holder on the property. Bad news. Did it, how many people knew that one? Okay, all right, well, that's the problem. You know, if you don't pay the taxes, the next thing you know, you're out, you're out the door. And this has nothing to do with even the, the loan on the house. I'm talking about a free and clear property. You don't own it if it could be removed from your possession. Okay, next thing I want to talk to you about, automobiles. You have an automobile out in the parking lot. Automobile has a California license plate. Let's say that the, that the automobile is fully paid for. So you sit here, you think, well, I own the automobile. Guess what? You have the certificate of title. The state of California has the title. You are driving the state of California's automobile. And the state of California says if you want to drive our automobile, you have to insure the automobile. You have to make sure that you follow all the ru rules of the road, and you also have to accept all the penalties that come with it. And you have to realize that if you do something like drunk driving, we're going to take our car back. There's even states where if you go solicit a prostitute, they'll sell the car. So you're an equitable lien holder. You know, you can transfer the car on a lien basis to another equitable lien holder, but you are driving the state of California's vehicle. Federal Reserve notes in your pocket. Who do they belong to? Federal Reserve. So if you're driving down the road and you have $15,000 in Federal Reserve notes sitting on the seat and a police officer pulls you over and he sees the, this, uh, these documents, he will pull them and give them to the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve says, well, prove that they're yours. Let's see some kind of bank, bank transaction record to show us that you should be in lawful possession. So Federal Reserve notes are non-interest bearing debt notes. They're not money because when on a constitutional basis, money is gold and silver. So here you go. You don't own your home, you're a lien holder. You don't own your car, you're a lien holder. You have temporary use of Federal Reserve notes. In the theory, they're, when they're in a pocket, you have the equitable use and you're, you have a lien on that, on that as well. So what do you own? Gold and silver. That's it. Gold and silver. Now, in 2003, 2004, I went on the George Norrie show. And I think it was the second one. And I told George, because they put the Lear Financial on there, I told George, I said, George, I just sold all my stocks, all my bonds, all my investments, and I bought gold bullion. And I would recommend, because the Lear commercial had just run, I would recommend that all your listeners do the same thing. I was that sure of it, because I, I watched the markets, and I, uh, I used to be an S&P trader, and I, things started to look really bad to me. So I went out, and I bought all this gold. And I went and doubled my wealth by doing nothing other than allowing the United States government to mismanage itself. I bought the, most of the gold at 420, and I think it's closing it's closed around 960 or 970 today. And it's, and it's going to take off from there. My expectation is it's going higher because, you know, you keep printing paper, these Federal Reserve notes, you know, non-interest bearing debt notes, and people tend to think that they're money, but think about it. If gold and silver constitutionally are, defi are defined as real value wealth, then everything under the zero line is debt. So that if you do some work for me and I uh, owe you a hundred dollars, I give you a $100 United States Federal Reserve note, then I'm, I'm discharging your debt with a debt note. 
So we're awash in debt. These are all IOUs that we're swapping back and forth. And as long as we all think that the emperor's got clothes, then they're worth something. But the problem is, and I've got the chart here to look at, that when you look at the chart that shows the buying power of the Federal Reserve notes since 1920, it's lost 94% of its buying power. So this is, if this was a gas tank and we were out in 94% of the gas, we'd be down to 6%. We're not going all that for, much further. Think about that for a second. And you know, I've heard the stories in Germany about how when their paper currency crashed, that it took a uh, wheelbarrow of paper money to go buy a loaf of bread. And I was thinking, wow, is that really true? Well, I met a 95-year-old lady from Germany about six months ago, and I asked her the question. She says, it was true. That's exactly what happened. So I just want you know, this, the whole idea of, of this kind of uh, gathering is to try to gain truth and awareness. And I can only tell you that when I have my assets in gold, and the gold is buried underground, it's not in uh, safety deposit boxes, because when the banks crashed in 29, they put the chains in the doors of these buildings. All the boxes were looted, most of the boxes. Never, people never saw what they had. So, you know, uh, underground the earth, in the Earth Mother is the way uh, I think people should go with it. And uh, there are different techniques that you use to make sure that if you were to pass away that other people have some idea where to, where to get, you know, your heirs would, would get it. But I can tell you what it's done for me is I can put my head on my pillow at night and I can go to sleep. But if I was sitting with my assets and Federal Reserve notes, and of course most of the 401k people already have been already thrown to the mat for 50% of what they had, the rate in which they are printing this paper, they say they're 11,000 billion in debt now, I like to phrase it that way, a trillion to me is can't even grasp it, 11,000 billion in debt, but if you add Social Security and Medicare obligations, they're 50,000 billion in debt. It's a number that's unsustainable. Now it's uns unsustainable. And for some reason, you know, I was hoping Obama would be a smart kid. He seems like an intelligent kid. But, you know, how do you spend your way out of indebtedness? I don't, I don't understand it. How do you spend your way out of indebtedness? And of course, bailing out Wall Street, the banks, and the rest of these people that have created the problem, there's no justice in that either. So I'm, I'm sure everybody here is pretty in, in agreement on that. <laughs> I don't think many of us like to see what assets are left just get squandered away. Anyway, I just wanted to make some political commentary. Now, the bad news for me up here is that uh, I'm, I'm flying this. Uh, this lecture aircraft, and I've got two of the engines burnt out because I had asked that the uh, um, people, the technical people here, come up with a projection system for me that would project printed matter. I, because m my situation is that technology changes so quickly that almost all my archives on things are printed. And as a consequence, for some reason, there was a uh, cross connection, and they were unable to get the projector to do the work that I wanted done. So what's going to hap happen here is, I've, luckily, most of the, the presentation that I've got here, you know, I'm going to be like a sixth grader, and it's going to be show and tell. Uh, I do have the assistance of the screen here, so we're going to have a little amplification factor. But most of the paperwork and discussions I'm going to have here is information that's on the Internet. Some of it's on my website, and some of it's on other people's websites. And I can give you the uh, keywords to Google uh, to get any of this information that you want to pull up on your own. Okay, let me move on here. First of all, my background is, is that I've been a bug sweeper for almost 40 years now. I've been in electronics for a, a really long time. I got my first high voltage electronic shock that threw me to the ground when I was 12. I grabbed onto a high voltage tube and, uh, you know, maybe it helped. It might have given me the little brain boost I needed at the time. I don't know, but anyway, somewhere around uh, 1968 or so, I started to move into this special kinds of investigations. And um, I have an interesting group of people that I worked for. I was sitting here just trying to make a list. Over the years, some of the people that were 
that wanted the services of having their telephone lines secured and their locations swept for bugs and to, to make sure that they had their security were billionaires, pornographers, gangsters, perverts, murderers, smugglers, gun runners, psychics, UFO contactees, crooked lawyers, crooked doctors, bookies, stock market traders, S&M clubs, prostitutes and madams, <laughs>